The Legend of Zelda The Minish Cap. I still remember seeing this game on the shelf on the store and taking it home, not knowing too much about Zelda games before playing this one. Minish Cap was one of the very few Game Boy Advance games that took my attention away from Pokemon, and I really loved this game as a kid. I never ended up beating it completely though. I remember having trouble with the final boss in the game, but I did end up making it to that point twice on two different save files, and it's one of the very few times I ever replayed a game as a kid that wasn't a main series Pokemon game. I don't know the Minish Cap nearly as well as I know the main series Pokemon games, but I do have this official Nintendo Power Strategy Guide to help us through this game. All around this guide seems more in-depth than any of the Pokemon guides we've looked at so far, so let's see if we can follow this guide exactly to help us beat The Legend of Zelda The Minish Cap as intended. Before we get into the actual game, how about a quick snack? That's where Boxu, today's sponsor, comes in. Boxu is a fun and delicious subscription box service that delivers the best flavors of Japan straight to your door. Each month, Boxu has a different theme for their boxes, so each month will be a unique experience for you to enjoy. These boxes come straight from Japan, which I think is so cool, and first time Boxu customers will receive the Seasons of Japan box so they could get a taste of the snacks per season. If we take a look at the nice boxu that I have, we have a great assortment of yummy treats and a wide variety. Everything in this box looks so delicious and I really like the Puki Puki Thai Chocolate, which is a Thai or red snapper that are associated with New Year's celebrations as a symbol of good fortune in Japan. I've always wanted to try one of these and I'm finally glad I was able to thanks to boxu. I'll definitely be snacking away at my boxu while we hammer away at Minish Cap. You can get 10% off savings up to 47 USD on your own authentic Japanese snack box from Boxu by using my link, which will be linked in the description, and by using code C10. That's S-E-A-1-0. Starting off, the guide explains the events of the Minish Cap, and to sum it all up, there's the small group of people called the Pokori or the Minish that we need help from in order to defeat evil. The guide then explains the basic controls and mechanics of the game, which was a nice refresher, then goes into detail with each of the items in the game. This leads us into the very first event in the game, the Pokori Festival. The festival takes place once a year in Hyrule to honor the Pokori people that helped Hyrule long ago. We start off in our house asleep, of course, and I name my character Link. I always like to name my character Link in all the Zelda games that I've played, and then Zelda comes in to wake us up and take us to the festival. Before we leave, I pick up the 20 rupees from this chest like the guide said to, and get the sword for my grandfather that I have to deliver to somebody at the festival. I follow Zelda around the festival, and then she wins this tiny shield which she ends up giving to me. The guide then says that that's all we have to do in the festival, so now I have to head up north into the Hyrule Castle. On the way we run into a Deku scrub that likes to shoot its nut at people, weird. But luckily we can use our shield to deflect the nut so it can't hurt Zelda with its nut anymore. We then make it into the castle where I deliver the sword and get to stay for a special ceremony involving the special Pokori sword. Vadi comes along shortly after to take the sword and whatever is in the chest that the sword is sealing away, but instead he ends up breaking the sword and unleashes monster all over Hyrule as that's all that was in the chest, then he turns Princess Zelda into stone. The King of Hyrule then tasks us with going into the Minish Woods to meet these Pokori people to see if they can help us fix the Pokori blade, seal away the evil again, and then turn Zelda back into human. The Pokori only speak to children, so it's up to us to find them. I head out of the castle with the new sword that my grandfather gave me and the shield that Zelda gave me, and across the Lawmon Ranch into the Minish Woods. The guide shows us where to get a heart piece, and then where to go to meet Ezlo, the talking cat. The guide has a funny excerpt about Ezlo saying, Ezlo will offer advice on what to do next when you press the select button. Because you have the wisdom and foresight to purchase this player's guide, you probably won't need his help, but it's worth talking to him for the pure comedic value of his comments. The title for this objective where you meet Ezlo is also called Get Capped. I noticed some interesting phrases in this guide which tells me that whoever wrote this probably had a lot of fun in coming up with some of these titles. The next thing we have to do after finding Ezlo is to shrink so we can find these small Picori people. This part of the guide shows us how we can shrink is called Honey, I Shrunk the Hero, fittingly enough, where we can shrink by finding these special tree stumps with these markings on them. This allows us to make our way into the Minish Village and meet the Pokori people. The Pokori speak a different language than the people of Hyrule, so in order to communicate with them, we have to find the Jabbernut, again, what's up with all the nuts in this game, and eat it so we can learn their language. I find it marked on the map in the guide, along with another heart container, 
Then I talk to the Pokori Elder where he tells us that in order to restore the Pokori Blade, we have to find the four elements that were unleashed by Vati when he broke the sword. I don't really understand why, but this task is called Abbey Road in the guide, which I'm assuming is a reference to the Beatles for some reason. The first element the guide tells us to go after is the Earth element located in the nearby Deepwood Shrine. As soon as I entered this area, I began to remember it when I first played through it as a kid, and more about this game in general. This was one of my favorite games as a kid, and playing it again after all of these years is bringing back memories that I haven't even thought about in years. Luckily the guide has a full outline of this dungeon down to only two pages, also making it pretty easy to navigate. The map outlines all of the keys and where to find them, and continues to make classic rock references with one of the tasks being titled Under Pressure, where it tells us to move statues over a pressure plate to hold the door open. I eventually make it into the room with the Matter Pillar, which is the first mini boss. The guy tells me to strike his nose quickly, then attack its tail while it's frozen, so I hammer away at this boss a few times to kill it, and get the Gust Jar, which was one of my favorite weapons in the entire game. It's a jar that you can use to vacuum things up in your way like webs, among many other uses. This allows us to unlock the path to the real boss of the dungeon, which is a bit harder than the Matter Pillar. We need to use the Gust Jar to defeat this boss, which is the giant Choo Choo, making it lose balance and then fall over so we can strike it with our sword. I manage to defeat it and get the Earth Element which I take back to the Bakori Elder. On my way out of the village, the guide also tells me to stop by this one house where we meet somebody who gives us a bomb bag as well as 10 bombs, which is very useful to use in other areas of the world. Now that we have the Earth Element, we can head back to Hyrule Town, and on the way the guide tells us about some secret areas where we can use our bomb bag to get some shells as well as find some fairies that can heal us. Once I make it back into the town finally, there's a lot for us to do. First, we are greeted by a man who tells us all about kinstones. Each kinstone is only half of a kinstone, but when you talk to any NPC in the game, you can actually ask them to match up kinstones with you, and if you do, a secret area will open up in the world to unlock a special treasure. Most of the kinstones fusions are optional according to the guide, and you can find kinstones all over the world, but the guide does have a section at the back of the guide detailing more about them. The next objective is called Mo Money, referencing hip hop this time instead of classic rock for once, where it tells me to buy a bigger wallet for 80 rupees, so I do that. I'm a few rupees short, so I have to go back into the grass to find a couple of rupees, but I end up getting it anyway. Next, we have to clean up part of the town square using our gust jar, help this lady with her chickens to get some rupees out of it, stop by the bakery for no apparent reason since there's nothing here, the guy told me to do it, so I did it anyway, and also learn a new sword technique. The new technique that we learned allows us to do Link's signature spin a as the guide puts it, where Link swings his sword around in a circle, allowing us to dispatch multiple enemies at once if we hit them all. After showing the technique to the guard in the northwest corner of Hyrule Town, they let us proceed onward to collect the second element we need, the fire element. On the way there, we end up picking up this bottle in the Trilby Highlands, which could have easily been missed since you need the bomb bag to access this area, and have to see this special indent in the wall and know that you can blow it up. Looking back, this game has a few instances like this which are pretty easy to miss, and I don't know how I was able to nearly beat this game as a kid without any help from the guide or the internet or anything like that. This jar ends up being very important for getting the fire element though as we use it quite a lot. Now we're led into Mount Krennel's base, and we have a long way to go before we reach the top. First, I use the jar we just got to fill it up with water and water this plant so we can climb up it. This takes us to a hidden spring we need to fill our jar up with the mineral water that can be found in it for later. I eventually make it to an objective called Water to Vine, where we have to plant a seed in a certain spot and then grow it with the mineral water we just got so we can climb up it again. This takes us to another business scrub who sells us a grip brain that we can use to climb certain areas of Mount Krennel. The guy then wants us to go to the secret spring where we can get a bigger bomb bag, and then the next objective is to move some stones out of our way, which the guide appropriately calls Rolling Stones. Going back to that classic rock theme once again. I continue across and eventually make it to Malari Mine, which is a mine made by the Pokori people. Here we have to show Malari our broken Pokori blade so he can help us and try to fix it, and also get his permission so we can enter the Cave of Flames, the dungeon where the fire element is located. The Cave of Flames has a couple of more objectives than the Deepwood Shrine did, but once again we have a clear map to follow in order to get us through to the end. The first few sections are simple and straightforward, and the cool thing about this area is we can ride a minecart around and change the track around to alter where we end up. The guide does a good job at documenting all of the little extra things we can do here that you don't really need to do, like collect some extra kinstones and rupees, 
and I eventually make it to the first mini boss of the Cave of Flames, which were a bunch of metallic choo choos. I lay waste to the intrepid band of choo choos with a few swings of my sword and get the cane of Pocky, or is it Pachi? I'm not really too sure, but either way, it's a cool little item that lets us flip things over or fill up some holes with magic to shoot us to a higher elevation. It's no ordinary stick, as the guide puts it, and the next two objectives are titled Flip It Good, and then after that, it's Biggie Small, continuing this weird dynamic of referencing classic rock songs as well as hip hop at the same time. I really wonder if whoever proofread this guide at Nintendo or whatever noticed the references since out of all of the guides we've looked at so far in this series, and we've done quite a few by now, this one has the most interesting titles for each point. I continue to follow the guide and use the cane of Pachi to flip over various things in order to progress, which eventually leads us to the big key room, which we can use to fight the boss, Glee Rock. Another thing I really like about this guide is although I've played quite a few Zelda games before, I never actually knew what the names for most of the enemies were since a lot of the enemies aren't ever named in game. So finally learning that these things are called Choo Choo's and this boss is Glee Rock was pretty cool. Anyway, in order to defeat Glee Rock, I have to use the cane on its shell in order to flip it over, then walk across its neck across the lava to strike its belly a few times and run back before it flips over, throwing us back in the lava. The boss fight was definitely more difficult than the last one this time around, since the lava and fire got in my way quite a lot, getting me as low as one heart, but I keep on hammering away until it's defeated, giving us the fire element, the second of the four needed elements to restore the Pokori Blade. As I head down Mount Krennel, I go back to the Malari Mine to get the white sword that Malari made for us, and then we're told we have to visit the Element Shrine which is in the basement of Hyrule Castle. I head over there with the two elements that we have to learn a new technique that allows us to create a temporary double of myself, which will help for some puzzles later on. As I walk out of the castle, we encounter Vadi again, and we learn that Vadi was once a Minish along with Ezlo, and worked as Ezlo's apprentice. Eventually, Vati got greedy with power and turned on Ezlo, stealing one of Ezlo's magical hat that gave him wishes and also turning Ezlo himself into a hat. After this, the guide has us run around a bit and do some other small tasks in the wild, like get a bigger wallet, and eventually return to Hyrule Town for some other small things like visiting the figure gallery, which is an optional place you can visit to redeem your shells for these collectible figures. But after doing all of that, we have to head to the Caster Wilds to start off the quest for the next element, the Wind Element. I try to walk through this mud over here but start sinking in, and then eventually Ezlo says we have to go back to Hyrule Town to get some special shoes that will allow us to cross this mud. I go into the shoe store, and the shoemaker immediately just falls asleep right in front of me as I walk in. The guy says we have to shrink into Minish size to climb up to his desk and talk to some Minish that are hiding out over there, who tell us that we need to get some special mushrooms in order to wake him up. In order to get these mushrooms, we have to cross the Lon Lon Ranch, but first we have to help Talon and Malin who own the ranch on Lon Lon Ranch since they got locked out of their own house by turning into Minish size, breaking into their house, and taking the key out for them. Now that we have access to the rest of the house, we can also access the rest of the Lon Lon Ranch which opens up a couple of new areas like Lake Hylia where we find this dog who is upset that her owner spends too much time in Hyrule Town and not enough time with her. Her owner happens to be the main shop owner where we got our wallet from, so we have to go back over there in Minish Size where he offers us another empty jar if we feed his dog, so we go and do that. Now after doing all of this we can finally head to the witch's house in the Minish Forest buy some special mushrooms, and use it to wake up the shoemaker so he can give us the Pegasus Boots. With these boots, we also learn a brand new sword technique that allows us to run with our sword out and finally be able to travel through the mud in the Caster Wilds in order to get the third element, the Wind Element. I travel through the Caster Wilds with our new Pegasus Boots, and the first thing we have to do is pick up three special Golden Kin Stones as well as this bow. This bow is used on these Igors in order to wake them up by shooting them in the eye, so they move and we can walk around them, among some other uses for the bow that we'll get to later. I spend a decent amount of time collecting all the needed items here, and then I finally was able to find these three statues that we can match those three gold kinstones with that we just found, in order to access the next big area, being the Wind Ruins. The Wind Ruins is just a small area with minor obstacles like these Armo scattered around, but at the end we find the entrance of the Fortress of Winds. I get through it rather quickly, and one of the first things we have to do here is use our bow to shoot out this eye in the wall to open a door, and then eventually climb to the top of the fortress to unlock two keys, that will fall to the bottom of the fortress after we find them, then we have to go chase after them. 
The Fortress of Winds is also where you can get the Mole Mitts, a useful item for digging through certain objects to have access to a few new areas or find some secrets. I remember using this item a lot as a kid to find secrets all over Hyrule, but to be honest I don't remember much else about this dungeon at all. I noticed that the titles for these dungeons are also a lot more bland in the guide compared to previous ones, with them being titled things like Key Drop Number 1, where the first key drops, and Platform Obstacles, where you have this small obstacle on a moving platform. But in the objective called Nightmare with a K, we have to fight this evil looking knight who for some reason is called a Dark Nut in Zelda games. And I'm not really sure why there's so many nuts when it comes to this franchise. This dungeon was much longer than the dungeon to Mount Krenel though, but after hammering away and gathering both keys as well as the important boss key, we now have to fight Mazel to clear the dungeon. This is a very unique boss as we have to use our bow to hit a target on each of its hands until both hands are broken, and then turn into Minish Size and climb into its head to knock out one of the pillars inside of it, and also possibly use the Mole Mitts to dig to find the pillar. This goes by very smoothly, however after defeating it I am not given the Wind Element just yet. Turns out the Wind Element is somewhere else entirely we won't get into a little bit later on, but instead I get this cool Ocarina of Winds item that allows us to fast travel throughout Hyrule much easier. Sort of like how you'd use Fly in a Pokemon game. The next section of the guide details the water element, however there's a lot we need to do in order to open up the dungeon for the element first. The first thing the guide tells us to do as we're leaving the dungeon is that we can use our new mole mitts to dig into these red circles in some walls for some extra goodies. Next, it tells me to use the Mole Mitts in the Trilby Highlands to get some Kinstones infused with Tingle. However, Tingle doesn't appear over here for me for some reason. I'm not sure if I'm doing something wrong or what, but I decided to just skip this for now and figure it out later, and if I end up being the boomerang that he's supposed to give us, we can just go back later on. I then make my way to Lake Hylia and speak with this Minish person who tells us we have to go to the library in Hyrule Town to get information on the Temple of Droplets where the water element should be located. I make it into the library and shrink down to Minish size so we can talk with some of the Minish living in the library, and they tell me that since they live in the bookshelves, having some of the books taken out of the library limits where they can travel, so it's up to us to locate the books and return them to the library so the Minish can travel freely in the library and communicate with each other. On my way, the guy tells me to fill up one of my jars with water and specifically says that it's not for drinking since that some people of Hyrule might bathe in that stream. I then go on a wild goose chase all over Hyrule to locate the three missing library books and it turns out that water was needed to extinguish the fire in some people's chimneys so I can climb up the chimney as a Minish and locate some of the books. On my journey being a librarian, I get the Power Bracelet as well, which is a very useful item that allows us to push heavy objects in Minish size, making being in Minish size much easier overall. I also thought that it was pretty funny how when I was getting the third book from the local mayor, it also said that I can't use water to extinguish his fireplace like I did to retrieve the previous two books, so I'll have to exact retribution in another way which turns out to be by knocking out all of his precious masks on the wall and breaking them in an act of vandalism against the mayor in order to get his overdue library book. Now we can finally return all of the lost books, speak to the Minish Elder in the library who allows us to go to the Temple of Droplets now, and also get the flippers on my way out of Hyrule Town that finally allow us to swim in some water. I'm guessing we're definitely going to need this item in the Temple of Droplets, and hopefully the water element is actually there, unlike with the wind element not being in the Wind Fortress. I swam my way to the entrance of the Temple of Droplets, and it turns out that the entrance is actually just a Minish transformation point that makes us fall inside the temple once we transform. The description for the temple says how it's considerably more complex than other dungeons, which you can see by the map and just how massive it is, but quote, to make matters worse, you have to listen to Ezlo moan about how cold it is, as the guide says. I think it's funny how the guide writer puts a few jabs at Ezlo here and there since both the guide writer and Ezlo are supposed to help us throughout this game. To make things even harder in this dungeon, the floor of this area is all ice, so I have to deal with sliding around and try not to fall off. Most of this dungeon involves moving around some ice blocks, melting some ice by opening up some of the ceiling panels to let some light in from the sun, and falling through those holes, so I take it to the hole and get wet as the guide says for these objectives. There's a whopping 32 objectives in this dungeon spawning across 7 different pages, with the only point where I got stuck being in this one room with the Firewinders. The guide made no mention of how to kill them, I tried killing them with my sword, using the gust jar, and even pouring water on them with my jars, I even went out to get the water, but none of that worked. I thought that I had to defeat them to travel outside of the room, but it turns out that you just can't kill them and you're supposed to just walk right past them. 
The guide overall did a good job at helping me get through here though, since I don't think I would have been able to get through here without having this guide. For example, you have to go underwater at this one very specific point to find one of the keys underwater, with the only real hint being that there's this one little frame that says the key is at the bottom of the jar, and the rock formation near where you have to dive kind of looks like a jar. I know I said this before, but after playing this game again after all these years, I really don't understand how I was able to beat this dungeon or most of this game as a kid. This eventually leads me to the boss, which is a giant frozen Octorok. Technically, it's a normal sized Octorok, I guess, since we're minish size. But this boss was actually pretty tricky. I had to deflect the rocks that it shot with my shield to damage it, then light its tail on fire with the lantern after. The lantern was the big cool item we found in this dungeon, by the way, and I'm just realizing I never mentioned that we found it. What made this boss even more difficult, though, was that it was hard to tell when it would shoot me with a rock or try to suck me up and then spit me out and sometimes I would deflect the rock at the wrong angle and miss the Octorok. I actually ended up dying in this boss battle twice, but I returned to dispatch it quickly on my third attempt. This now gives us the water element, the third element we need to restore the Pokori Blade. Now we have to go back to the element sanctuary under the Hyrule Castle to power up our sword, although for some reason I'm not allowed to go back in the castle right now. I'm not sure why, I guess I missed that somewhere in the story, but if I'm tasked with saving the princess, I don't see why the guards stop me if I get too close to the castle. I have to sneak past the guards instead, and now this time we can find Grimblade hiding under the grass over here as well to teach us how to shoot beams from our sword. This seems like it would be a very powerful attack, which it is, but it only works when we have full health. Now we have access to a brand new area being the Royal Valley, where the old King of Hyrule's tomb is. On the way I get a bigger bomb bag, go through this spooky forest, and light these mummies on fire since the guide said I should for quote, maximum enjoyment, because who doesn't enjoy painfully burning their enemies? I eventually make my way to the old king's tomb where his spirit appears and gives us a golden kinstone that we can use to unlock a door in the Vale Falls. I head to the Vale Falls next, climb to the very top, and make my way to a brand new area again called Cloud Tops, which will eventually lead us to the Palace of Winds, which is where the wind element really should be hiding. The main objective we have in the Cloud Tops is to find some more of those golden kinstones and merge them together in order to cause some pinwheels to spin up here. Once all of the pinwheels are spinning, the gate to the Palace of Wind will then open. This pretty much means that we have to fly around across all these clouds here, but on the way I notice an objective called Electric Boogaloo, which shows us how to beat an enemy that we haven't seen before, and the enemy is named Lakitu, like the thing from Mario Kart. I had no idea that Lakitu was also in Zelda games, or if this guy just made a mistake because they look so similar, but it was pretty cool to see nonetheless. I eventually make it up to the top and to the entrance of the Wind Palace, but right in front of the palace, the guide suggests that I bottle a couple of fairies that I can use to heal myself later on since this is a pretty long dungeon and we definitely will be needing them. We're way up in the sky now as we enter the dungeon and there's many places to fall, which I did quite a few times trying to get through here. The big cool item we find here though is known as the Rock's Cape, which lets us jump a little bit higher and farther. This is necessary to get through to get to the Wind Element, but in order to get it, I have to defeat a few Wizrobes first. I had no idea that these things were even called Wizrobes. I thought Wizrobe was just some Smash Melee pro with the sick Captain Falcon, but I guess that's where he got his name from, and after I defeat all these Wizrobes, I finally get the Rock's Cape. These fans kept blowing out air, which was pretty annoying too, as well as these nuts I had to vanquish, as the guide puts it, and it even told me to dispatch an enemy at one point, which I thought was pretty funny. This leads us to the boss, Georgos, I am probably not saying that right, which are two flying monsters. One is smaller in blue and hovers around, while the other one is big in red and stays stationary in the middle. In order to defeat them, we have to split into three different lengths and hit the red one in the eyes in the right ways that they open, and then jump on the blue one after the red one is blinded to hit one of its four eyes as it's open and dodge its tail as it spins around under us. This boss took me quite a while to defeat since I kept missing my jumps onto the blue one, but luckily I was able to finally defeat and get the final element, the wind element. Now the guide wants to do some final preparations before we go to fight Vati in the castle, which include going back to the castle to fuse the wind element with our sword in order to make the legendary four sword. This allows us to transform into four different links at once now, and also shoot this beam when we do Link's Spinneroni attack. Eventually, Vati comes as I exit the chamber, and it turns out that he was disguised as the king for a little while, and he trapped the real king in a jail cell, and he did all of this in order to lure to the castle to find out where the light force is, and it turns out that the light force is actually inside of Princess Zelda. Vati then turns everybody but us into stone and tries to get Zelda, so we have to go and stop him. 
But luckily, our new signature Spinneroonie Beam Attack, whatever you want to call it, actually has the power to turn people that were turned to stone back into human, which is very useful to move this guard that was blocking our way when he was turned to stone. I go back into the main Hyrule Castle now and see it has this dark undertone from Vati's Evil Curse. This is basically like another dungeon from when we were going to get all the elements, except there's a lot more enemies to fight this time around. Runes with multiple nuts, whiz robes, and a lot of fire we have to avoid. There's even an objective here called Zoids because we had to make a trapezoid-like pattern with our Link clones, but when I first read it and saw it said Zoids, I thought of that cartoon from the early 2000s with the same name and thought it might have been a reference to that, but I don't think it was. Every room in the castle though is pretty much just a bunch of fights and towards the end when I face the very last nut, the guide says to quote, send the Crimson Knight to the same place as his fallen brethren, wonder where that could be? And now that we dispatch this entire castle, all that's left to do is fight Vati. This is the point of the game that I got to as a kid but just couldn't beat. Mainly because this boss fight is actually three boss fights in one, since Vati has three different forms here. First we have his standard form where he floats around with some magic floating eyeballs around him that shoot lasers. We have to kill all of these smaller eyes first, then we can attack Vati himself once a bigger eye opens up on his stomach. He eventually falls, and now we have to take on stage 2 of Vati, where Vati is just one giant eye surrounded by a few smaller eyes. We have to shoot each of the eyes with our bow and arrow to open them up, and then once four of the eyes are open, we have to split into four different links and hit all the eyes at the same time, then repeatedly hit him over and over again until he finally dies. I had to do this quite a few times to knock it out, and every time you shot the eyes, it was different eyes every time, depending on which side he was facing, and it was quite tedious since it was hard to clone myself with all the debris falling everywhere, causing me to restart a lot. And now we have the final form of Vati, which looks like this weird, creepy, demonic creature. We have to use the cane of Pachi on each of its arms, then go into Minish Size and climb into the arms to destroy them. After both of his arms are destroyed, we then have to split into four links again and shoot back the four lasers this time but hit them with our sword. I had to do this so many times when I was doing this since I would either miss one or two of the orbs or get hit while trying to clone myself, causing me to have to start the whole process over again and wait for the cooldown. After what felt like hours, I finally defeated Vati, saved Princess Zelda, as well as the rest of Hyrule. That also means that we finally beat The Legend of Zelda The Minish Cap as intended, thanks to this official Nintendo Power Guide. Overall, this guide was actually pretty good. There was a few minor errors where it would tell me to go east when it really meant I should go west, but that was easy to forget with the map. Overall, I wasn't able to distinguish as many mistakes as I normally do with the Pokemon game since again, I really don't know the Minish Cap nearly as well as I know some of the Pokemon games like Fire Red and Leaf Green or Diamond and Pearl, so if there was any mistakes or any of you hardcore Zelda fans out there, please let me know in the comments down below. I also want to give a huge shout out to Mystery Ore once again for inspiring this whole series with his original Minecraft video who will be linked in the description, as well as each and every one of you for supporting my channel. As I'm writing this, we are just under 75,000 subscribers, which is crazy, and pretty close to 100k, which is even crazier. Especially since only just a few months ago, around Thanksgiving or so, when I started the first intended video, we only had about 20,000 subscribers, and that's after years of doing YouTube. I plan on making the next intended video on a Pokemon game though, but doing a non-Pokemon game that I wasn't too familiar with this time around was a lot of fun too. It definitely took a lot longer to make than I anticipated. It's been about two weeks as I'm recording this since I first started playing the game, and I still have to edit a good chunk of this as I'm recording this, but it was still a lot of fun to play through another one of my childhood games again. Let me know in the comment section down below what you thought of this video, and also consider leaving a like as one like goes a long one helps the channel a ton, and subscribe for more videos. And with all that being said, I want to thank you all so much for watching. Hope you all have a great rest of your day. I'll see you all next time, and bye bye.